I don't know what I would do if my RV got towed. Without it, I think I genuinely don't even want to think about what I would do. Because it, I just, I don't know. <laughs> Be out on the streets in the tent. Again, yeah. Just restarting again. They've been coming hard and strong, taking everything. We don't want to be out here, you know. We're trying to do the best we can. It's pretty difficult when they don't give us very much notice. It's pretty devastating because people are losing everything that they own when they don't own much to begin with, so. 30 to 50% of people who are unsheltered in Seattle live in vehicles. That can be anywhere between 3,000 to potentially up to 5,000 people. It's hard to say because like most point in time counts, they're a bare minimum estimate. Uh, many cities like Seattle have regulations that push vehicles that are oversized, such as RVs into industrial zones, which are often very far from where social services are located. So there's a really systemic disconnection between many people who are living in vehicles and the actual social service systems. So outreach that can come to people who are living in vehicles Vehicles is essential for keeping people connected to housing navigation, social services, and medical care. What we do is we go out, we meet people living in vehicles, we'll buy batteries, buy cabs, get people things they need to move their vehicle, because if they get to get swept, they'll lose their home, they're walking the streets, and there's no shelter beds available. All this. All this is gonna get swept tomorrow morning. Well, I have to work on getting our stuff out of here, into here, so we can, and then hauling this so somewhere. Well, we can use my truck if you have like a chain or something. Yeah, I just like have that. to get it off the front of the RV, getting over there in time yeah. before they take it. Where's Nap? I can take you to over, Napa. Can you really? Yeah, like the one in uh, Hudson. Soto, or in Georgetown, yeah, yep, yeah, yeah. that's where I have the part on yeah, here. Yeah, I'll take you over there. Let me go grab the box of stuff I have for my son to send to him, and then uh, I'll be ready to go over there. I'll grab the money. Okay, here. perfect. It's hard. Uh, they're, they're our neighbors too. Oh, so many people just like to sh close their eyes and just, you know, oh, they say there's housing, so there must be housing. Well, then why are they still out here on the street three, four, five, six years later after getting swept around all the time? Like, there's no housing. We come out every day on Monday through Friday. It's still inadequate because I have such a large area I cover. We usually talk with about 50 to 60 people who are living in RVs, vans, cars each month. They call it a shelter referral. If you look at it politically, it's really smart because the administration can say, hey, we can justify our sweeps because these people are getting people into shelters. But there's no shelter to refer people to now. The sweeps happen twice a week, but all of this is just moving the same people over and over again. Okay, go forward. I've been in the motorhome approximately nine months, and it hasn't been easy. When you just get settled in, you've got to get up and move. It doesn't give you any time to really do anything. Where are you going? I don't know. Got a round circle. Oh, I'm gonna wait. That's okay. That's okay. One more. Come on. It's a Subaru. Oh, yeah. But then we all know I'm not a nice guy. He's not a nice guy. I've trained him. I've been going out with Joe for about three months now. I'm a psychology student at the University of Washington. I'm technically a scribe, so I do all the paperwork. Unofficially, I'm his legs, so I. Yeah help out walking around, knocking on doors, stuff like that. We have a client down here that we uh, talked to a couple days ago. We're dropping off some food. Hey Chris, you home? It's Joe and Jonah. We got some food to drop off to you. He's been here for three years and he has a real good relationship with the lady that lives in the house. But parking enforcement finally found him. So we have gotta move. I might need to close the back of the car. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be driving past your area, and I have winter stuff for the Mylar blankets and the hand warmers. Yeah. And then I'll probably reorder some of those sleeping bags, those instant ones that we had. Yeah. Now we're 
finally funded by the city and we do vehicle residency outreach directly. Um, we work now with parking enforcement and the courts. Parking enforcement would refer us to people so they wouldn't get impounded. Being homeless is traumatic in different and unique ways and so having some understanding of that helps. Uh, three of our four people are formerly homeless um, and they've all lived in a vehicle at one point or another. So they have a better understanding of what comes uh, with living in a vehicle as well as just uh, it takes a while to, to agree to let someone help you. Because I've been doing outreach for over 20 years. I've been homeless multiple, multiple times throughout my life. And so, you know, I relate to people that are homeless. I'm good at listening and talking and responding to their needs. Everything I do is free for the client. The only promise I'll make is my best effort because if I promised results, I'd be lying and we've been lied to enough. I'm here to help them get what they want. I'm not gonna do it for them, we're gonna do it together. But I'll give people gas money, I'll give people, like I did doing today, giving people bags of food. But what I do is build bridges. A bridge is a trust of honesty with each other. Joe is awesome. Like when I first met him, I felt so comfortable talking to him. And the fact that he's been on the streets is a huge difference. A lot of people down here have trust issues, but him being on the streets helps, you know, because he knows, he knows, he knows. <laughs> Not only have they helped me, they help me help other people immensely, like to put gas in my truck so I can move RVs so people don't lose their home. The city sweeps them and takes their home, <laughs> takes their homes. I lived out here off and on for uh, the past four years. My sister lived right here. She lost her home because, well, she doesn't work. She's sick all the time because she has cancer. She has treatment and stuff. And, you know, I take care of her as best as I can. Her doctor said, I have a choice. You know, you can spend it with your sister or you can work. You know, I quit that day. Hey, that, where are you going? Um, to my friend's place to go try to get warm. <laughs> Joe and Jonah have been coming and visiting me pretty often. They brought me to Goodwill and brought me clothes. They've got me food before, so I really appreciate them. I've been homeless on and off since I was about 16. My mom was in a critical health condition and couldn't really take care of us, so I had to live with my stepdad. He made me pay rent even though I didn't even have a room, you know? <laughs> and he would kick me out randomly when he would drink and stuff like that. I would just kind of not know where to go, and eventually it gets to the point where you just don't want to come back anymore, you know? I'm 19. I'm just making it by here, I guess. <laughs> There's a lot of uncertainty. Just dealing with today is how you kind of get by. Because when you're going day by day, it starts becoming more of a here and now, what I gain right now, instead of a, what's going to be good in the long run, what's going to help me get somewhere, you know what I mean? Well, I've been trying to get into housing since day one, pretty much. There's an outreach called Youth Care for 18 to 25 year olds. I was working with the counselor there for like months. I thought I was on the waiting list and then recently I found out that he doesn't even work there anymore and that I have to go to a different place to find housing, at, like counseling at all. And the waiting list, if you do get on it, it's like two years. Joe and Jonah have a schedule thing that they get from their work that says where they're going to sweep every month. So if where I'm at is on the list, they'll tell me like two weeks prior and it really, really, really helps. Because normally you don't get any notice, you get maybe the three day notice that they put up. In order to move, I have to find somebody who has a usually a truck or something big enough that can pull this by a rope, which is also terrifying. You have, have to have someone steering it also, and it's real stiff and the brakes barely work. It sucks. Everything falls over in here, and yeah, it's a huge process. And I've only been here for about almost three years, and I've moved probably about 20 times. Nowhere that anyone goes in an RV can ever be seen as a permanent place. The business can just tow it at any point if they decide they want to. I don't know what I would do if my RV got towed. Because this is my everything, this is my home, this is my, my cat, it was basically my kid. Without it, I think, I genuinely don't even want to think about what I would do. Because it, I just, I don't know. <laughs> Be out on the streets in the tent. Again, yeah, just restarting again. I walk up to them and I can feel the trauma and the apprehension they have. It doesn't shut off when I go home. And so sometimes, like the first time I met Luck, I go home and cry, and, and I don't know how to deal with that. I feel what's going on on the street. 
I feel the hopelessness. How many people live in there? Just you? So you just want a permanent spot for your RV? Or would you take housing if it was offered? That would be nice. Yeah. And I, you know, why should I lie to you? Finding housing just sucks right now. So, you need a fuel pump. What I'm gonna do now is go down to Napa. And then if they have the fuel pump there, I will pick it up and bring it back. That'd be great. And it doesn't mean I'm a nice guy because I'm not a nice guy. I have an RV that needs a fuel pump. It's a 82 Pace Arrow 454. For the homeless person, buying parts for vehicles, especially if your vehicle isn't running, you have to walk without a parts store and then walk back. And not all homeless people can do their own work, like the guy we just bought the water pump for. If it's coming out of their pocket, they have to give up food, they have to give up either medicine, prescribed or non-prescribed. It's a point of crisis. Then they're SOL and they could possibly lose their home. So guess what? It's in the back seat. <laughs> you need some socks? Always. How about three pair? That'll work. They tried to tell me, the, um, I sat in the driver's seat and where they come up about six deep telling me I got to get out and I said, no, can't do that. I'm a taxpayer, 11, 12 years through the union. I mean, call it what you want. Uh, I should have a right to park somewhere, whether it's one day, three days or a week, but these concrete blocks, they are illegal. Putting they were planners. supposed to remove them December of last year, state or whatever, just kind of threw up their hands and. They're doing nothing about it, but yet they'll come and ticket me every week. I should be out of here in about a half hour. Where are you going? I don't know. Okay, well call me and let me know where you end up. All right. You know, that way I can come by and harass you, especially about the tab. You've moved three times in the past four months. You have until 9 a.m. to have your stuff out of there. If not, they throw your shit in the garbage regardless. They have it demolished. They have bulldozers come in and tear it down then we have to start all over again. Like we really have it to start in the first place. What are we blocking? Please answer me if we're blocking a business or at Malkway. We're not. We're not bothering nobody. We're just trying to live. My best year was 63 people in one year getting off the street into home. Some of them went to other programs. 26 of them went from the street to a market rate job to a market rate apartment. This is my purpose in life. I know the trauma of being on the street. I know the trauma and the fear of not knowing what's going to happen next. You don't experience the true meaning of trauma until you see it on the street like this. Yeah. One thing to watch things on TV or read about a theory but it's another thing to sit across from somebody who's hungry, who's dirty, who needs a bath, who doesn't have enough clothes. Reducing vehicle residency in our communities means including vehicle residents in our systems of housing and our systems of social service care. Uh, and that means providing spaces for the wide variety of people to connect with existing services that are in our community. Sometimes that means overnight safe parking programs for people who want to move out of their vehicles as quickly as possible. But for some people who are living in larger vehicles, such as an RV or detached trailer, they may need more time to be able to connect with social services, or they may just need a space where they can live in their vehicle long term as affordable housing. And I think that that's really where the solution lies, it's looking at the diversity of vehicle residents and how we can bring them in to connect them with the existing services, both overnight temporary parking spaces, longer term supportive parking spaces, and more permanent stable parking spaces that are similar to an RV park or a mobile home trailer park. They want to be recognized as a person, they want to be recognized as someone of value, treat the person in the RV as a person and not as one of them homeless people.